Hello viewers, welcome to my second theory video for the world of ice and fire, and as promised, we will be talking about the others, and this is admittedly a very significant topic to tackle as the others are a main factor in the books and in the show, and there are an awful lot of YouTubers who have covered this topic already, not to mention the massive volume of tinfoil rabbit holes you can travel down on Reddit or on the wiki and so forth. So I had to put uh, quite a lot of research into the making of this video, and it was correspondingly delayed a lot longer than I thought it would be, and I hope it will be worth the wait for all of you. Also, I've provided links in the description to as many related videos as I could find, so check them out if you want to continue your own research into this topic. And as I did in my first video, let's start out with a little geography and also a little bit of discussion about our author George R.R. R. Martin. Now this map shows the world of ice and fire that I'm sure we've all come to be very familiar with, and I'm sure we're probably all aware of the three major continents. The two we see uh, most frequently in the books are of course Westeros, located in the west, and Essos in the east. And there's also Southeros in the south, and I know I'm not the first one that's looked at this map, and notice it stops abruptly up here in the north of Westeros, and over here in the east of Essos, and thought to myself, hmm, we have a Westeros, an Essos, and a Southeros, but where's Northeros? I have to suspect that given George R. R. Martin's naming conventions, and that these areas of the map are specifically omitted when they could have been just as easily filled in like the rest of the map, that there is very likely a Northeros somewhere, and that it has been omitted for a good reason. We could also take this theory a step further and speculate that Northeros, in fact, connects the continents of Westeros and Essos together. There's a lot of evidence suggesting this might be the case, including uh, shared legends about the Long Night in both the north of Westeros and in Yi Ti of Essos, and a line of castles guarding the northern boundary of the north, and a line of castles guarding the eastern boundary of Yi Ti, and the land beyond the wall in the north growing progressively colder, and the land beyond the eastern boundary of Yi Ti apparently being a cold wasteland as well, etc. etc. A YouTube user AltShiftX covers this theory in some detail, and I have a link to his video in my description below. And I have one bit of further evidence supporting this theory that I will cover later in this video, so keep this in mind. Now, speaking of naming conventions, let's talk about George R. R. Martin for a little bit. Many people have pointed out, and George R. R. Martin himself, I believe, admitted that his name for the series, A Song of Ice and Fire, is a clear reference to the poem Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. It is a poem about destruction. It touches on the microscale of human destruction and how humans destroy each other, and it also works on a macro scale of how the world could end as a whole. Or in other words, if you want to boil it down, it's a poem about death. And this isn't the first time that George R. R. Martin has named one of his works after a poem. In fact, his very first novel, Dying of the Light, was named for a poem written by poet Dylan Thomas in 1951. The poem has no title and is commonly called by its first line, Do not go gentle into that good night. This line is repeated throughout the poem, and the final lines of the poem are, Do not go gentle into that good night rage, rage against the dying of the light. The poem was supposedly written by Thomas for his father, who died the following year. So again, it's a poem about death. And when we read these poems, they intuitively make sense. After all, we've been likening death to cold and night since pretty much time immemorial. It's an intuitive metaphor for us. When Charlton Heston says, you can have my gun when you pry it from my cold dead hands, we don't sit and think, wow, Charlton, you wordsmith, cold, dead hands, how true that is. We immediately recognize the symbolism, and we move on. And when we hear an author referring to the spring of youth, or to someone's autumn years, we understand what these references mean, and by implication we also understand that the winter season is also symbolic of death. 
And George R. R. Martin lays this imagery on us heavily and consistently throughout the Song of Ice and Fire. In fact, in the very first prologue of the very first book, we hear Will, Garrod, and Waymar Royce of the Night's Watch having a protracted discussion about the cold. And we hear how Garrod has lost toes, uh, ears, and a finger to the cold. And we see that Garrod is a man who is intimately familiar with the cold, and yet the cold of this place therein seems unusually cold to him and consequently garrett is in fact the first one of the group to recognize that something was wrong very very wrong now normally i'd wait until the end of the video to give you my theory but i'm sure most of you can see where i'm going with this already so why don't i just lay it right out and then we'll fill in the details afterwards my suspicion is that the others are actually the dead and the overwhelming volume of literary death symbolism is simply the first of a series of clues hinting that this is likely the case. Now with that said, I can already hear all of you theorists out there going, but wait, we've already done this research and we know that George R. Martin has specifically said the others aren't dead. But believe me viewers, when I say I understand, and I actually do agree that the others are not dead, and I will explain my reasoning throughout the course of this video, so buckle up, we will get there. Now let's start by addressing this quote from George R. R. Martin, which comes from an email that Martin wrote to graphic artist Tommy Patterson for the graphic novelization of A Game of Thrones. Patterson states that I had many talks with George. He told me of the ice swords and the reflective camouflaging armor that picks up the images of the things around it like a clear still pond. He spoke a lot about what they were not, but what they were was harder to put into words. Here is what George said in one email. The others are not dead. They are strange, beautiful, think oh, the Sedai made of ice, something like that. A different sort of life. Inhuman, elegant, dangerous. So there we have it. Straight from the horse's mouth. The others aren't dead. End of story, right? Well, let's look at one more quote from George R. R. Martin on the others, this one taken from an interview with Robert Shaw, where Shaw asks, Do you know what substance an other sword is made from? And Martin replies, Ice. But not like regular old ice. The others can do things with ice that we can't imagine, and make substances of it. Now you're probably thinking, okay, interesting enough. But how does this help your theory? If George R. R. Martin specifically says they're not dead, then that's that. They're not dead. Well, let me begin to answer by pointing out that aside from the others themselves, these quotes mention two things, those being reflective, camouflaging armor, and ice swords. And then comes this very bold closing statement that the others can do things with ice that we can't imagine and make substances of it. Now, the reflective camouflaging armor does sound a lot like quantum stealth to me, which is a technology various physicists have conceived of for some time and which researchers have been trying to implement, uh, particularly for military applications, but which generally hasn't been put into broad production yet, uh, at least that we know of. And as far as the ice swords are concerned, however, I admit I'm at a total loss. I can't think of a realistic analog in our world for this without doing some uh, pretty extreme mental gymnastics. So in any case, either of these technologies is certainly beyond our current level of technological capability. So the others, whoever they are, must certainly be pretty advanced as a race, and they most certainly are doing things with ice that we can't imagine. But on the other hand, no pun intended, the others have only existed for either 6,000 or 8,000 years, depending on which Maester's historical timeline you believe in. I say that because they don't appear in any histories before the Long Night. And I'd have to think that with the first men being in Westeros for at least 4,000 years prior to the Long Night, they would have certainly met the others at some point, just like they met the children. So the others would have shown up in the historical records, and the first men would have known who the others were, and when the long night happened, it wouldn't have all been such a big shock. So if the others really have only existed for 6,000 or 8,000 years, they have advanced incredibly fast. In fact, I would say unbelievably fast, since by comparison, 
by the time humans had been around on Earth for 6,000 or 8,000 years, we were still banging rocks together, wearing hides, and trying to develop some kind of spoken language. So whoever or whatever the others are, they must have some way to acquire knowledge unusually fast. It's usually at about this point in similar theories that the theorists start referring to the children of the forest. After all, the children supposedly have some kind of powerful magic, and they live much longer than humans, and they're telepaths, and when they die, their souls go into weirwoods to join a great collective consciousness. All great reasons why they could acquire knowledge, and consequently technological development, much faster than humans in the same world, right? Plus, both the children and the others are found far north of the wall, so it's all a nice, tidy package, right? The thing is, I have a hard time believing this line of reasoning. Let's think back to the first time the children enter historical records, in the Dawn Age, when the first men begin migrating to Westeros and start chopping down weirwoods, causing a great war between the humans and the Navi. I mean, the humans and the children. Now, the first men had bronze working, they carried shields, and rode horses. This gave the first men far better force multipliers than the children apparently had developed. We are told that the first men were larger, stronger, and more technologically advanced than the children. Yes, we are also told that the children shattered the arm of Dorne, supposedly with their magic, and also tried to do the same with the neck, again, also supposedly with magic. But in the end, the might of the first men proved too great, and the children were forced to accept a peace agreement. Of course, one could always argue that we believe the first men had superior technology simply because we're reading histories written by humans. But to that I argue, look at the results. The first men received far more land from the pact than the children did. So the children, despite having longer lifespans than humans, and having access to their hive-minded weirwood trees, and having access to magic, whatever that is, they still had not developed a level of technology that the first men had developed at the time of the invasion of the first men. And even today, it appears that they still have not kept up pace with humans. And the, uh, we don't have any records of the children invading anywhere, either. They seem to be a fairly peaceful race, while the others have already made one major invasion of both Westeros and Yi-T, and seem poised to do so again. Long story short... Relentless technological progress, uh, the weaponizing of that technology, and using the technology for invasion are all traits exhibited by humans, not by the children. So I find it hard to believe the children had anything to do with developing the armors or the swords that are carried by the others. And of course, I, f I find it even harder to believe uh, that the giants could be credited for any of this either, since they don't have any developed society or metalworking or agriculture even. So that really kind of narrows it down to just the humans. So if the others really are humans, or at least caused by humans, how could they have developed these advanced technologies while humans in Westeros and elsewhere have only developed essentially Iron Age technology in the same time frame? For this part of my theory, let's go back and re-examine the chronology of the Dawn Age. We've already talked about how the first men invaded Westeros, and in response to the invasion, the children fought against the first men for generations. They broke the arm of Dorne, and tried to break the neck as well, before finally coming to a peace with the first men called the Pact. But then after the Pact, a strange thing happens. The first men live at peace with the children for some 4,000 years, but instead of the children adopting the culture and beliefs of their invaders, the first men adopt the culture and beliefs of the children. They start worshipping the gods of the children, now called the old gods, and they carve faces into the weirwoods. But it seems that the children and the first men were even friendlier than that. Much, much friendlier than that. In fact, it seems that the children and the first men had been interbreeding. Some people within the world of Ice and Fire, and many fans as well, believe that the Cranach men, with their smaller, slender stature and more simplistic natural lifestyles, are the result of interspecies relations between the children and the first men. But I think even more convincing than this is the ability of some humans to warg, or skin change. We don't have any record of any humans doing this before the coming of the first men, 
but we have records of the children doing this all the time and those humans that have this ability today appear to be exclusively descended from the first men such as wildlings and starks or sweet robin who is descended from house tully and note that jojen reed is supposedly some kind of green seer another trait that was at first only found in the children so during four thousand years of peace and interspecies breeding the children and the first men likely produced thousands of human wargs or to use more modern terminology telepaths and this brings us back to one more aspect of the children that i mentioned previously that when they die their souls pass into weirwoods while we haven't witnessed this firsthand in the books it does seem pretty damn likely given what we have witnessed and to me it's entirely plausible that humans could achieve this feat as well we've already seen bran interacting with the weirwoods quite extensively not to mention blood raven also known as brendan rivers who by the way is also descended from the first men through his mother's blackwood genes so by the time of the long night there would be thousands or more likely millions of human souls living in the weirwoods alongside the souls of the children of the forest this would explain why the first men adopted so many of the children's customs such as carving faces in the weirwoods worshiping the old gods holding important ceremonies in front of the weirwoods and so on they're doing this so that their ancestors in the weirwoods can witness these events as well there is one problem with this scenario however some humans aren't necessarily the kind of people that you'd want hanging around with you in a weirwood for eternity. Try imagining Veramir Sixkins living forever inside a weirwood tree. He doesn't strike me as the kind of character who would be content with that kind of existence. So what might these types of humans do? Personally, I think they try to search for a way out. And we've already seen a few options for this in the books. The easiest option seems to be warging into an animal, such as Hagen, who warged into his wolf Grayskin, or Oral, who warged into his eagle. The downsides to this option are, for one, you're an animal, with all the limitations that come along with that, and for two, any other skin changer can apparently come along and steal your animal away from you, as Verimer did with both Hagen and Oral. Another option would be to try to warg into a living person, such as Bran does with Hodor, and which Verimer tried to do with Thistle. YouTube user Preston Jacobs presents an entire video series on the character of Sweet Robin, and theorizes that souls living in the Weirwood throne in the Eyrie have been trying to take possession of Sweet Robin. I highly recommend watching this video series, by the way. If you haven't already, it is one of the best theories I've seen describing the overall big picture of the world of Ice and Fire. I have, of course, provided the link in the description below. And this would also explain High Heart and why it is believed to be haunted. But the downside to skin changing into a living human is, for one, it appears to be far more difficult than with animals. And for two, the process appears to be far more distasteful besides, given how Bran feels when he takes over Hordor's body and how Thistle reacted when Verimer tried to take her over. I can't imagine inhabiting a body like this uh, would be very pleasant on a long-term basis or necessarily preferential to living in a weirwood tree. Now, a third option could be inhabiting the body of a dead human. And you can probably guess correctly that I'm referring to whites. This would solve the problem of having to contend with another rival soul trying to inhabit the same body. And this method apparently also comes with the fringe benefit that you get access to the memories of the dead person. As we've seen, Jon Snow and Verimer Sixkins both notice that the whites they encounter seem to retain personal memories. The downside to this method is, of course, that the body you inhabit is dead, and it only functions according to whatever decayed or decomposed state it was in when you found it. And if the hand that Alistair Thorne brought to King's Landing is an indication, the bodies appear to continue decaying, and eventually you wouldn't have a body to inhabit anymore. As additional support for this theory, the bodies of the two whites found by the Watch during a Game of Thrones just so happened to be found next to Weirwoods. And this may also explain why the wall seems to block telepathy. Just like John can't sense ghosts on the other side of the wall, so also the spirits of the others are likely blocked from entering the bodies of humans on the other side of the wall as well.
The only reason the whites found by the Night's Watch were able to pass through the wall and attack Castle Black from the other side was because they were already inhabited before they were brought through the wall. Notice that their eyes had already turned blue when the Night's Watch found them by the weirwoods. So, when I put all this together, what I see are a bunch of souls trapped in weirwood trees who want to get out, but don't really have a reliable means of doing so. Sure, they have some options, but all of the options have their shortcomings. But all these souls are interconnected with one another, and they've got nothing but time on their hands. After all, some of them may be 4,000 years old. So, what would they be likely to do in a situation like this? It just so happens that George R. R. Martin has written another story called Guardians, set in his Thousand Worlds universe. In this story are a hive-minded species called mud pots. They're immobile, they're telepathic, they have this hive-minded network, and when provoked, they use their hive-minded intelligence to create new creatures to do their bidding. And I think this is ultimately what the others did as well. The hive-minded human souls trapped in the weirwood trees developed a technology where they were able to manipulate ice to accomplish their goals, and in this case, the goal was building new bodies, ones that weren't animals, weren't inhabited by other human souls, and which weren't dead and prone to decomposition. In fact, bodies made of ice would be just the opposite. They would be immune to diseases, and barring any physical destruction, and assuming you didn't stand around in direct sunlight and melt away, a body made of ice could theoretically last forever. In essence, the others would have solved the age-old question that dates back at least to the ancient Egyptians on our own earth. How can I live forever? And now we've come full circle to answer the question posed at the beginning of this video. How can the others be the dead if George R. R. Martin specifically says that they're not dead? And that's just my point. The others aren't dead. They are THE dead. But they're definitely very much alive. And this leads me into the final piece of evidence I have to present for this theory. We've noted previously that it appears likely that the first men were interbreeding with the children of the forest. And there's also evidence that the first men were also interbreeding with the others. We have a reference in A Game of Thrones and a second reference in Clash of Kings, stating that the others slept with human women. And we also have that story of the Night's King, you know, the thirteenth commander of the Night's Watch who fell in love with a woman with skin as white as the moon and eyes like blue stars. She had skin as cold as ice, he gave her his seed and his soul, and he basically went native, carving out a little empire for himself and his ice queen until he was defeated by Brandon the Breaker and Joramin the King Beyond the Wall. You've all heard the story. Now I admit, there's a lot of debate over whether this mystery woman as cold as ice was really an other or a white, as the descriptions we have are vague and really could fit either option as they are both cold as ice and have blue eyes, etc. But in either case, I've always had a hard time believing the story, just because of all the hurdles the protagonist would have to get over in order for the story to be plausible. I mean, this guy is the commander of the Night's Watch. And not long after the long night and the battle for the dawn, either. And Old Nan even says that he was a Stark. So this guy would have had immense social and cultural barriers to overcome. And I don't think it would have been just so simple as looking down from the wall one day and seeing some ice girl and thinking, gee, those are some nice blue eyes. I bet she's so cool. Hey, baby, are your pants made out of super advanced reflective armor? Because I can see myself in them. And oh yeah, as long as we're on that topic, I would have to think that there would be some pretty extreme physiological hurdles for a human man to give his seed to a woman with skin as cold as ice. You mean shrinkage? Yes! <laughs> Significant shrinkage! But what if that woman had been someone he knew? Or more to the point, what if that woman was a long-lost love, someone he thought was dead, but suddenly was there, alive in front of him, albeit in a different form. What if the Night's King had been Jon Snow, and the mystery Ice Woman had been Egret, or Robert Baratheon and Lyanna Stark, or Rob Stark and Jane Westerling? How many of the men have we seen in Westeros leaping over huge societal and cultural barriers to be with the woman they love? That is, of course, shrinkage notwithstanding. It shrinks? 
<laughs> like a frightened turtle. I also think it's significant that this legend goes a step further and says that the Night's King not only gave her his seed, but also his soul. That's a pretty specific detail, and has very significant implications if my theory here is correct. So now that I've laid it all out, I encourage you to not just trust what I've said, but research what I've said. You'll find that George R. R. Martin has exceptionally few direct quotes regarding the others, and even the content that he has written in the books is maddeningly vague. Even the encounters that POV characters have with the others are ambiguous and confusing and exceptionally lacking in detail, especially considering that the others have supposedly been dead for thousands of years, and seeing one alive would be, in the words of Joe Biden, a big fucking deal. You'd think that any of these characters would be staring at the others in awe, trying to drink in every detail. It's almost as if George R. R. Martin is intentionally trying to keep details away from the readers, saving his big reveal for the last couple books. With so little real detail on the others, any theory, including my own, has a significant chance of being incorrect. I also encourage you to read George R. R. Martin's other writings. Now is as good a time as any, with Winds of Winter being perpetually delayed. Try reading George R. R. Martin's Thousand World Stories. Preston Jacobs is running a book club for the Thousand World Stories that I also contribute my own thoughts to as well. And it's eye-opening how so many themes are recurring over and over in George R. R. Martin's stories. Themes including telepathy, hive minds, and inhabiting the bodies of the dead. And with that said, I'm very interested to hear what you all think, so do leave your thoughts in the comments below. Obviously, this theory has an awful lot of loose ends, and I'll throw in a couple of them for you to ponder and get you started. Such as, if this theory is true, did it have any impact on the cultural traditions of guest right and the taboo of kin slaying? Don't these carry far more weight if the dead spirit of a welcomed guest or a relative could come back looking for revenge? Or does this factor into the Night's Watch's vow of celibacy? I mean, is the Night's Watch really that concerned with the Black Brothers not having sex? There is, after all, a brothel in Molestown specifically for that purpose, and more children would mean more men to man the walls, which they badly need. Is it possible that this vow is in place to keep humans from interbreeding with the others? And what are the implications of the sacrifices that Craster leaves for the others, and also the practice of sacrificing to the others via the Black Gate of the Night Fort, as some theorists believe? And also, is it significant that the Black Gate is made of weirwood? And what are the implications of the sayings Valar Margolis and Valar Doheris? And what implications are there for the House of Black and White, which is, frankly, a death cult? And is it significant that the door to the House of Black and White is made out of weirwood as well? And how can we explain Lady Stoneheart and Cold Hands? They're pretty obviously whites, but they're not like the whites associated with the others. They don't have the trademark blue eyes, for example. I personally think that there must be some mechanism whereby a person who had inherent telepathic abilities may be able to re-inhabit their own corpse after they die. Lady Stoneheart is south of the wall, and if the wall truly blocks telepathy, she couldn't be inhabited by some other spirit. And Catalan Stark was a Tully, a family descended from first men, and she produced some children with strong telepathic abilities as well. Applying the same logic to cold hands, that pretty strongly implies that all of the fans out there are right. He's likely Benjamin Stark, also from a first men family that has known telepathic abilities. Plus, he refers to the deserters of the Night's Watch as foes. And what the heck are shadow babies, anyway? And finally, and probably most importantly, what exactly do the others want? Is it revenge for everything that's been done to them in their previous lives? Or is it self-preservation? Or do they believe that they are really doing humanity a favor, killing their mortal bodies so that they can, in exchange, live forever in werewoods or inhabit immortal bodies of ice? I haven't personally decided on an answer for this question myself, but I do think the answer revolves around one final clue found in A Feast for Crows. In Chapter 19, we go to the Iron Islands, where the Ironborn are having their king's moot. The first man who stepped up and made his case was Gilbert Farwind, 
lord of the lonely light. He told of a wondrous land beyond the sunset sea, a land without winter or want, where death had no dominion. Make me your king, and I shall lead you there, he cried. We will build ten thousand ships as Nymeria once did, and take sail with all of our people to a land beyond the sunset. There every man shall be king, and every wife a queen. Now, the first rule of public speaking is to know your audience. And in this, Lord Gilbert fails pretty horribly. I mean, these are ironborn. They're not going to want to give up their iron islands, their reaving, their iron price, and go to a land of peace. And Gilbert tries to inspire them using imagery of a ruinish queen. And his gifts are poor. And Lord Gilbert isn't even the head of the house of Farwind. Really, he's wasting everyone's time. Everyone knows it. And almost no one supports his cause. And the whole thing just seems stupid and very out of place. At least, it would seem very out of place. Except Lonely Light is the island farthest west in the Sunset Sea and the ironborn are descended from the first men, and the far winds are reputed to be skin changers, who warg into sea lions and walruses and whales. I opened up with a study of the geography of the world of ice and fire, and asked where is Northros. Supposedly no human has crossed the Sunset Sea and returned to tell what's out there, but walruses and whales are migratory animals. They can cross the Sunset Sea at their leisure, they can see what's happening on the other side, again, no pun intended, and if the far winds can warg into the minds of walruses and whales, then they can see what's out there as well, and apparently what they see is a wondrous land, a land without winter, or death, where death has no dominion, a land beyond the sunset, or beyond death, where every man and woman is equal. I think that this ties in quite well with Martin's pacifist, anti-war leanings that so many theorists have pointed to and that are so evident in Martin's other writings. I think the world of ice and fire is a world that is weary of war, and is desperately waiting for the humans to stop fighting each other and choose peace. Thank you all so much for watching. In the description I will leave a few options for topics for future videos. Please cast your vote in the comments for what you'd like to see, and I'll try to get going on a new video in the upcoming weeks.